Hello folks and welcome back to English 306 with me, Dr. Matt Barton. And my god, <laughs> uh, this is just probably my favorite movie of all time. I absolutely love Dawn of the Dead. I've watched it many, many times. I never get tired of watching it. Uh, I like it so much I didn't even want to watch the remake because I'm always disappointed with remakes 99% of the time and I just didn't want my image tarnished. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of Dawn of the Dead, so I, I'm holding off. I might watch it eventually, but uh, you know, I've been holding off on that. Uh, so it's really fun to get to talk about uh, the movie, and I love uh, this book too, Bishop. I really think he shines in this chapter where he starts analyzing this movie. And I mean, I guess I probably watched it a hundred times, <laughs> uh, but when I read this chapter, and even rereading the chapter, I'm, I'm still like, wow, I didn't really think about that aspect of it, or I didn't make that connection, which. You know, which is uh, really the sort of thing you want to get up to in a really good rhetorical analysis. You want to be finding things, pointing out things, making connections, uh, fusing things together that the typical watcher, you know, or somebody even like me who's watched it many times, wouldn't notice, wouldn't make those uh, connections. So it's it's really, really good movie, really good analysis, <laughs> really good, good rhetoric and writing. I mean, well, what's not to like? I don't know. Uh, but anyway, we will uh, try to get into this again. I'm going to try to keep it as brief as possible. You know, obviously we could spend all day on this, but you probably have other things you'd like to do. Uh, at least, uh, well, I'm not sure I do or not, but <laughs> I'll try to respect your time. Uh, but I do want to get into the neo-Marxist implications of this, the feminist implications. A little bit of the narrative perspective was also employed in this chapter. And then uh, we'll get into like these concepts of consumerism, alienation, self-actualization. Uh, and then a little bit about how this movie works as an allegory. And then finally the colonialist, uh, imperialist dimensions of Dawn of the Dead. Again, stuff that I never even noticed, you know, many times of uh, watching this film. So I'm glad to get to go uh, look at those again. Uh, to start us off, though, uh, a fun question. Um, or maybe not so fun, who knows these days, but how do you feel when you're out at a mall? Someplace like Crossroads Center, local mall here, been there many times. Uh, <laughs> just walking around looking at, uh, some people go to the mall not just to shop, and that's part of the fun, but also just being there and watching other people shop, being sort of part of this environment, if you will, this ecology, whatever you want to call it. And so just try to, uh, you know, imagine being there and just, Think about how it makes you feel. How do you feel while you're shopping there? I'll just leave it at that, let you answer. Okay, so, so moving on. So this is Bishop's argument in a nutshell in this chapter. And so he says, By painfully illustrating the destruction of the social systems that have become so essential in the United States of the 1970s, uh, I would argue same is true today, but uh, anyway. Uh, Romero paints not a grim dystopian vision of how things might be, but rather the way things already are. Commodities and material possessions ultimately provide no happiness. True self-actualization comes only through labor, production, purpose, and community. So this is his thesis here. So I'm not going to talk about this more at the moment because we want to build up to this conclusion. We'll look at his evidence for this and uh, see if we agree with him that this is what the movie's all about. All right, first he talks about the allegorical uh, function of the movie. And remember from the from that narrative perspective by, thank golly, uh, what is it, Fisher? <laughs> I'm blanking on the name at the moment, but uh, anyway, that uh, second perspective we talked about the narrative and we talked about how these uh, you know this rhetoric works in fiction by setting up some characters and setting up a, a story and a plot and then there's a, a moral of the story right these are the lessons you should learn or you should glean from watching this what happens to these characters who are acting in these ways things either turn out well for them or things turn out badly there's some kind of moral lesson there to be learned uh, and allegories uh, the reason that they work is a lot of times if you just talk about the problem in society as it is, uh, it's very distracting. People get very heated about it. Uh, you know, it, it backs people, they get their hackles up. You know, if we just start talking about uh, some, some kind of modern, current political, you know, uh, event or drama, uh, people tend to get too emotional. 
Right. It's hard to be really dispassionate and objective and just sit down and think about uh, the situation. So allegory, uh, the way this works is we'll say, okay, well, we're not, we're not going to be talking about, you know, whatever the current political situation is. Uh, we're going to just tell the story about some uh, other thing, right? So, <laughs> uh, make it a science fiction story, uh, a horror story, something like there's obviously no real life thing of a zombie. <laughs> so it's fiction, uh, thankfully. Uh, so we, if we put this in the context of a zombie story, uh, then suddenly people can get into that. People can enjoy the, the, uh, the story. It's kind of like a, a subtle way in, you know, kind of gets under the radar so they don't just reject it outright. And then they see how this story plays out, this allegory. Uh, so it's a way to persuade people, or at least get them to consider alternative viewpoints uh, that they might reject if you just came out with it, uh, you know, straight. Uh, so this is what he's talking about here in this, uh, in this excerpt I, I pulled from the reading. Uh, so he says that most of the scholarship with this film focuses on the, basically the neo-Marxist stuff. It's it's set in a mall, <laughs> a consumer paradise. <laughs> so it's pretty obvious. You know, a lot of people watch this film and they come away with that uh, idea. Uh, but he is going to uh, go a little bit beyond this in his analysis. But, but nevertheless, I think that is probably the allegory that Romero is trying to tell, right? This insatiable need to purchase, own, and consume has become so deeply ingrained in 20th century Americans. And it's uh, so ingrained, in fact, that even when you die and come back as a zombie, you're still drawn to the mall. It's kind of uh, freaky. And you know, if you go to the mall, uh, there's a movie called Mall Rats, by the way. You might have seen it with Kevin Smith. And, uh, but anyway, when you go to the, uh, the mall, especially after watching this film, uh, you might... You know, look at people there and wonder, you know, they kind of get this dazed, glazed uh, sort of look in their eyes. They're kind of going from store to store. It's this, what you might call mindless consumerism. This this idea that they just keep buying. If they buy the right products, if they spend enough money, somehow that will make them happy. Uh, owning all of these wonderful things. And uh, this is all largely what... Uh, the neo-Marxists are always on about is this is you know you could buy the whole mall you could own the whole mall and you might think that's going to make you happy but you know is this store is this uh, movie makes pretty clear and I think <clears throat> pretty realistically <laughs> that probably wouldn't work out too well in the long run um, so here's a bishop here <clears throat> he says I argue that Romero zombies are not merely a metaphor uh, they also act as the catalyst that reveals the true problem infecting humanity. And what is that true problem, according to um, Bishop? That is, the zombies effectively destroy human society, or after the zombies effectively destroy the society, human society, the few survivors attempt to rebuild the society according to one single paradigm, pervasive consumerism. Um, because the shopping mall provides them with all the supplies they could want, they no longer have the need and perhaps even more importantly the ability to produce any goods themselves. So this is the, the little bit here that uh, Bishop is bringing to the table. So it's not just about consumerism. It's not just saying, well, you know, you can buy all these things. It's not going to make you happy. You could own the whole mall and you could still, still be miserable. <laughs> uh, the problem is not how many things you own. Uh, the problem is you're not producing these things, uh, and this is what we'll delve into. Uh, there's some some kind of joy, something inherent, something fundamentally human uh, about wanting to make things, produce things, grow things, and that the further you get away from that model, uh, or the less of that stuff you do, the more alienated you're going to feel, the more miserable you're going to be. Uh, so here's the question number two then. So have you ever done some kind of arts and crafts? Have you done some gardening? Uh, maybe some other crafting, do-it-yourself, anything. Uh, how would you compare your satisfaction with the finished product you got from this thing you did yourself uh, versus just buying it ready-made at the store? All right, so moving on into this topic uh, of alienated, or alienation and labor and self-actualization. So he, he quotes a Hegel here, who I guess, uh, you know, Hegel was the inspiration for a lot of Marx. Uh, but I really think Marx is the one that really hammers on this idea of neo-Marxism. 
which we don't often think about when you think about socialism and communism. You don't really think too much about this aspect of what Marx is actually saying. Is it's very important you produce things. You're not just sitting around uh, getting everything handed to you. That's not really what uh, is going to make you happy, according to uh, Hegel and Marx. Instead, it's this idea of a certain type of labor. And so the idea, again, is that you're you're not just... Uh, you're, you're, the way you achieve consciousness and self-awareness is through this um, productive labor. And if you don't have it, if you're basically if you're not making anything, you're not growing anything, you're not doing anything like that, you, you start to lose your humanity. Like what? The essentially uh, human aspects of yourself and you regress to a more primitive state. So I think uh, most of us could agree with a little bit of this idea. Let's uh, move it forward here, and then I'll back up. So the problem in the movie is that these surviving humans only seem able to attempt a recreation of the lost structures of society, and they ultimately become fatally overwhelmed by the perceived need to own rather than produce. And so again, if you read Hegel and Marx, they give examples mostly about factory work. You know, imagine a, say, a cobbler, a shoemaker who uh, does everything there is, you know, putting the heel on it, bending the leather, working with that leather, putting in the knots, shoelaces, you know, you, you name it. If you make that whole shoe, pair of shoes yourself, uh, then you have this sort of satisfaction. Like, you feel like there's part of you that went into that shoe, that pair of shoes, there it is. You're kind of proud of that, makes you feel good. Uh, and the same thing with, like, growing vegetables. And you talk, talk to any gardener, okay, <laughs> or any farmer and ask them, you know, why is there some satisfaction to growing a radish or growing a spinach or whatever? Why not just go buy it at the grocery store? You know, you could buy all the work you put into growing that hot pepper, that tomato. Man, you could just go to Walmart right now and buy a bunch of those tomatoes and save yourself <laughs> a lot of trouble. And they would just look at you and say, look, you just don't get it, do you? You know, this is not, it's not the same at all. Yes, I could go and own a bunch of tomatoes by buying them at the grocery store, but I didn't produce those tomatoes, right? I didn't grow those tomatoes. There's no, there's nothing of me uh, in that tomato that I just went to the store and bought. Uh, there's something that's just not there, right? And if I didn't have any, if I just, if you're just buying everything and you have nothing to do with the uh, production of it, you know, you become uh, alienated, right? It begins to uh, basically make you less human. You know, and I've also heard uh, Marx talks about, again, with these, uh, uh, with the factory work, there's even if you're doing factory work, again, if you're making the shoes, you sort of make that whole product. Uh, that's different than if you're working in one of these sort of mass-produced or assembly line type places where maybe all you work on is like a little piece of a wheel of a car. <laughs> maybe your job is just like hammering in some uh, little bolts. You don't hammer in bolts, but, but you know what I'm saying. Like if you're just drilling a hole, you know, and then the next one comes along, you drill a hole in that one, and the next one comes along, you drill a hole in that one. Uh, basically, you're just doing some small part, some small repetitive thing, you know, day, hour after hour, day after day, and you really don't see much of yourself in this. When you finally see the finished car, you, you can't even really see, like, what, you know, I had something to do with that, making that car, but it was just some, like, tiny little aspect, so I, I don't really feel like that's my creation over there. It's uh, too big. You know, there's too many other hands uh, where at work on that. And that uh, Marx talks about this as being uh, alienated kind of feel like an alien, you know, again, just not, not a human. Uh, something uh, has happened there. You're, you did have something to do with the, the labor of that, but it was such a small part, and it kind of got lost in this, you know, big manufacturing uh, process. Uh, so, again, the more valuable thing would be to, uh, you know, if you had the one worker who was uh, trained in all the things that could make, you know, all the parts of the car might take longer, uh, but they would have a better sense of satisfaction and arguably make a, a better product. And that was, by the way, the philosophy behind a car company uh, called Saturn. And that was their big uh, marketing, you know, a big uh, revolutionary thing. You know, I guess you could judge for yourself <laughs> how well it worked out. <laughs> uh, but they really wanted to make it, make the workers there feel like they had more to do uh, with uh, making those cars than just, you know, fastening a, a, a gasket or whatever, you know, putting that little piece of a transmission on. Uh, you know, they tried to give you a, a lot of different parts, a lot of different roles, uh, a lot of different kinds of uh, 
relationships with the managers and supervisors and, and so on and so forth. The whole idea being to increase that feeling of ownership <clears throat> over that labor process. And, you know, I guess Saturn did pretty well for a while, but uh, again, uh, you know, who really talks about Saturn anymore? Okay, uh, shop to uh, you drop. So um, this is back to the uh, bishop here. He says, this instinctual drive to shop, as it were, is repeatedly emphasized by Romero, who shows the mindless creatures pressed up against glass doors and windows, clamoring to get inside the shops in a gross parody of early morning cell shoppers to resume their earthly activities of gluttonous consumption. Their addiction for the place. Uh, the new zombie economy, the goods on display, this is the part that I like. In the new zombie economy, the goods on display in the store windows are living, breathing humans, not merely clothes, jewelry, and modern gadgets. <laughs> so this is brilliant of Romero, and again, something I didn't really think about when I was watching this. And there, by the way, uh, there are scenes just like this in The Walking Dead. You know, I could point to several different scenes where they basically play on this theme. Um... Uh, but you got the humans or survivors in there behind the glass inside the store, kind of like store mannequins. And these uh, zombies come by and see them and they're like, ooh, I, you know, I want some. You know, I want that. And it's, if you ever watch those, uh, like the Black Friday <coughs> uh, sales and things, you know, they will, the, the shoppers there will show up at like five in the morning camping out in front of the store to try to get a cheap TV or whatever. And they will uh, literally uh, just pile on those those doors that that glass and, and break through and just come through it looks like a stampede of like buffalo or something just stampede and like that like zombies right just careening right through those um doors knocking over trampling you know, people get killed in these things it's very serious it's uh, not a funny thing you know they just you know pile through there stampede through there and it's uh you know again very disturbing uh to see that kind of thing and you wonder like what in the hell <laughs> what is going on it's uh you know the zombie economy you know i would you know i think a romero kind of had his finger on the pulse and i don't even know if they had anything like that back when he did this this movie so uh, but, but he saw it coming uh okay so moving on from that to feminism briefly uh, i certainly think you can see some uh much stronger feminist characters here it's much stronger female characters uh, women roles basically uh, in the form of fran uh, so if you watch fran uh, up here in dawn of the dead awesome character <laughs> like, yeah you'd certainly uh you, you watch this movie you think wow she's the only one with any sense and it's kind of like uh, uh ripley in the movie alien uh, you know, a lot of the, the guys in there far from being like the smart people that know what to do and you know, like if you watch the Night of the Living Dead, uh, first one with Barbara, like Barbara's kind of helpless, kind of hopeless. You know, you, you follow Barbara, you're dead. You're, you're zombie chow. <laughs> Whereas in a Dawn of the Dead, you know, if you don't want to end up a zombie chow, uh, you do what Fran tells you to do. Because you know, she's, uh, she's got the level head. <laughs> so kind of a dramatic reversal there. Uh, another reason I think Dawn of the Dead is a great movie. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's see what Bishop says. Uh, so amid the frantic shouts of so-called experts, reporters, and panicking technicians, Fran proves to be the level head. She takes charge of the situation, asserts her logical decisions, and even challenges the irresponsible actions of those around her. Romero quickly establishes Fran as a professional with a purpose. She has a job to do, and, the la and that labor gives her and the others at the new studio a reason to come together. You know, that, that, by the way, is a media studies, or if you want to do that media perspective, uh, at the start of this movie, you see the breakdown of the mass media, the news media, and uh, Romero's making some, some commentary there, I think, about the role of news, or at least uh, television news, I suppose, and, you know, how honest does it, you know, really, this and Night of the Living Dead, there is this presence of the media, the news, and, you know, a lot of people like to analyze this and see you know, was the news anchors, was was the news coming out of those studios, the giving people the right advice? Was it misleading? Was it propaganda? You know, what role uh, does the media play? And also the law enforcement, military, 
Uh, so there's a lot of other stuff going on we, we can get into there. Uh, but this is certainly true, right? Fran is there. She's, she's the again, the only person there at that news studio with any sense, with any moral integrity. And she only leaves that uh, job when it's basically she has to. There's no point in, in staying there anymore. Uh, and then finally he brings a, a bishop rather brings in a kind of ties this back into to uh, white zombie in that earlier period of the voodoo zombies you know although uh, obviously uh, Romero zombies there's no voodoo master there's no powder you know uh, nothing like that going on here uh, still it kind of harkens back uh, in the in the sense that when the uh, these survivors in this film they, they show up at that shopping mall and there's, uh, it's not an empty mall. Right? There's already basically people there. Yes, there's zombies, but you know these zombies are there. They're, they seem to be happy enough, I guess, shopping <laughs> or, or walk, walking the mall, however you want to describe that. And instead of uh, recognizing uh, that these are people, that we should just go somewhere else, we should just leave this mall alone. What right do we have to any of this stuff? You know, we should just go on and find an empty spot somewhere that's not... Uh, inhabited and you know maybe make a farm you know <laughs> there's lots of other uh, things you could do you could you could produce something instead of just trying to take uh, other people's stuff uh instead though that's you know exactly of course what happens uh the humans come in they see these zombies and they think oh we'll just kill these zombies and you know take their stuff uh you know you can't you know i guess uh you know, you could, maybe they would have tried to enslave the zombies if if they could have done that somehow. You know, it's not really possible given the, uh, uh, you know, the way Romero zombies work. If it was like the voodoo zombies, they, they could have done something like that. But it does uh, conjure up these images. You know, and again, this is what, of course, happens in the, the colonial eras, the age of imperialism in countries like Europe. And, of course, we've talked about uh, the United States is not innocent of this either. The United States went into Haiti in 1918, which is kind of appropriate given the, you know, this is where all the zombie stuff comes from. It's very apt uh, that it arises there. But yeah, these uh, sending the U.S. Marines into Haiti to take it over just uh, to protect the uh, U.S. corporations that were there. You know, I guess it was uh, sugar cane, if I uh, recall correctly. So not, not saying, look, there's already people here. They have their own thing going. What right do we have to their stuff? Instead, we just send in the Marines and, and just take their stuff. Uh, so it's kind of a scathing criticism of that here in uh, Dawn of the Dead. You know, again, coming back to that sort of the allegory of the mall and just uh, feeling like you have a right to come in there and take whatever you want. <laughs> and, of course, the, the lesson being uh, not only do you not have that right, but even if you do that, it's not going to make you happy. Uh, you're going to end up actually much worse off uh, than you were before. Yeah, in fact, this is back to a bishop in the Dawn of the Dead. Uh, the remaining humans find no joy or satisfaction from the mall's many pleasures. It has become a prison and the symbol of their now essentially meaningless lives. The uncanny in Dawn of the Dead works to manifest the repressed secret of consumerism. There is little true joy to be had from consumption alone. So we're kind of back to this. You know, money can't uh, buy you love, right? The, <laughs> you know, it can certainly help. Uh, it can certainly help you uh, to be happy, right? Nobody wants to be uh, destitute or without, you know, means of uh, feeding yourself and so on and so forth. But this, you know, idea that, uh, you know, more is better doesn't always uh, pan out. Right? The, the mall doubles its artificiality. It falsely represents a comforting lifestyle that was never really comforting in the, the first place. Uh, so, so there you go. Some ideas from Romero. You could certainly think about this in your own life. Next time you're at the mall, imagine what if you had all that stuff in the mall? You know, you could buy whatever you wanted, you know, just infinite <laughs> credit. Would you really be happy with that? Would that be fulfilling? Or would you, in fact, be better off on a little hobby farm somewhere, uh, raising your own vegetables and being somewhat self-sufficient or with a being with a small community, let's say, of people of, of like mind that you enjoyed uh, being with and had, a, you know, good good family ties and so on and so forth, a good social connection, uh, is that ultimately better than having all the all these commodities? You know, I don't have the answer. You know, this is just the <clears throat> the sorts of things that we 
uh, these movies invite us to ponder. All right, but we will leave it there. Hope you enjoyed this uh, look into Dawn of the Dead. I hope you enjoyed the film, too. But as always, love to hear from you. If you have comments, questions, whatever you would like to share, please do so in the chat. In the chat? <laughs> in the comments. <laughs> and I will see you next time.